Okay, I'm finally here. Holy mackerel. Uh, I was just trying to change the category to miniatures and models, which is apparently a brandy new one. And um, it just wouldn't, uh, which was weird. It would let me switch back to the Warhammer, but every time I just switched to miniatures and models, it just kind of was like, no. So, hello, I'm here. Hello, good evening. Uh, it is I, Benry Paints. Uh, just kind of a small time miniature painter streams on Tuesdays of me just kind of painting personal projects and uh, commissions when I get them. So, um, hopefully you guys have had a pretty good week. Uh, mine was pretty okay. I have uh, a bunch of stuff that I am right now 3D printing for a client and another YouTuber or VTuber, I apologize, Aria Silverfire. Um, it's basically done. I just got to do some cleanup and whatnot. But beyond that, uh, I think I'm about ready to get started. Yeah, new category. Hey, Dark Volt. Um, apparently, we finally got a miniatures and figurines category, and uh, it's very small right now. I'm looking at it, and there are a total of 76 viewers online and 97 followers, which is kind of funny because the Warhammer 40k category has about the same number of viewers right now. It's, it's very tiny. Hey, Hot and Cold AF, good to see you. Good to see you. First time chat. Very nice. Um, I'm just getting started uh, it's right now, so I'm just kind of uh, slowly, you know, warming up to it. But anyway, let's go ahead and get rid of the starting soon images. By the way, these were both painted by, or created by Dark Volt. I love them very much, and as soon as I have some free money, I am definitely going to commission more art, because I love this depiction of the little froggy lad. So let's go ahead and get the palette camera up, which looks horrifying, because I need to clean out the... Um, I need to clean out the palette paper because it's at this point starting to tear and crumple. Let's go ahead and go to the main camera and get rid of the starting soon image. Me freaking out over Horus. So I went into kind of a fugue state over the weekend when I had some free time. And he's not done, but he's a lot closer to done than he has any right to be. Um, the base didn't take as long as I expected, and I realized as long him got him glue, uh, glue, glue, uh, glove glues on the claw. Yeah, it was it was intense and terrifying um, because I had this was a very expensive model and I had no idea how to put it on properly. But it looks like I got it figured out. Um, so this is Horace right now. This is where he is. Uh, I ended up doing the base kind of frantically as I tried to figure out what to do with it, and I think by and large it turned out okay. I kind of want to go back and do some highlights on the Imperial Fist bits and also re-grime them up because I'm noticing there are spots that are just not well covered and uh, I need to go back over Horus's face. Um, I did a little bit of airbrush uh, object source lighting around his head and so I kind of had to repaint his head otherwise he just looked really really angry and um, but yeah I th and I need to do the uh, the trim the gold trim underneath his cape, which I promised I was going to do as kind of a non-metallic metal tutorial, because last week I had a viewer who was interested in learning NMM. And so you can see I've kind of done it across the entire model. Um, nothing on here is metallic paint, it's all simulated, and so I'm going to go ahead and try and do that again on the underside of the cape. And the other part of this that's kind of nerve-wracking right now is that he's on a display base, which means that I can actually pop him off of this base because he's on a smaller one inside the larger one. So I'm going to try and do this and not damage the model. So that part comes out, and then this part pops off, and I actually magnetized him. Oh no, you can see that the, um, are you feeling about Forge World Resin and having him for a bit? Um, the Forge World resin is a lot better than I expected, but it's still very kind of fragile, and that worries me. Okay, so this metal plate, uh, I actually... Yeah, the magnet didn't pop out because, thankfully, I glued the magnet uh, to the base, but the little metal plate that I had on the bottom of his base is what popped out. So I'm probably, definitely going to need to put that back on. Which, not a big deal. Not a big deal at all. That's That that was more of a security thing for me. But what I am going to try and do is... Uh, actually, 
Now I'm gonna work on his face. Working on his face seems like the more fun thing to start the stream off with because it's a high detail bitty bob. So I had his face perfect. Like it was beautiful. It was perfect. I love how uh, how flushed he was in the back and how how gaunt and pale he was in the front. But then he got sprayed with the airbrush, and so now his face is not quite as good now that I've touched it up. But I'm gonna go ahead and do a little bit more. You can see that there is a little bit too much of like. I don't want to call it delineation, kind of the opposite. You can see that there's a, a clear spot where the light ends and his face begins, or his skin begins, and I'm not, I'm not jiving with that look. So I'm going to go ahead and work on that a bit. And to do so, I believe the colors I need are some purple, some of this ultra brilliant red, and uh, this Ricard flesh. So I'm using different colors and different paints uh, for this because I'm kind of in this weird transition place. Um, I've been using Vallejo for a long time, and Vallejo is pretty good, but I'm getting kind of tired of some of their inconsistency. So I'm going to add some Royal Purple, which, if I recall right, was the base color I used when I first uh, base primed him and spray primed him. So I've got a, a Vortex mixer that I use to shake this stuff up so I don't have to... If you want to make sure the magnet stiff, I scrape the side I want to attach a bit, then super glue a little blob of green stuff on the base and the magnet slash metal plate. Yeah, that's a really good idea, and I've done that before, but I was just so excited to have Horus that I got real lazy. So, um, I'm probably going to do something like that off-stream once I, uh, once I go ahead and, uh, reattach that magnet. So, please, something else I have is that, uh, at my new job, my desk is pretty much my desk, and I can kind of put whatever I want on it within reason. And uh, something that we do is we actually uh, take hard drives out of old computers that we're surplusing and kind of getting rid of. And we have to hold on to the hard drives for uh, about two months just to make sure that they really truly aren't needed. And I found out that some of my colleagues, they actually keep them in like special storage devices or special storage places. And uh, one of them, he has like a little bass mouth fish cup that he keeps it in. And I thought that was kind of a cute idea. And I was like, I want to get my own. So um, I went ahead and just 3D printed the thing. And now I'm just going to have this humongous jar that's going to hold like my pencils and my and uh, my hard drives and all that kind of stuff. It was apparently made by Three Dragons Labs. If you're interested. It's really cool. As you can see, it's really big. I think I might have printed it a little too big, but I don't care. I'm going to go ahead and prime it up tonight and then uh, paint it up when I finish Horus, and we'll see uh, how long that takes me. Okay, I get lazy when I get magnetized by Brut uh, Brutalis belly guns. Now they're stuck because the green stuff cured a bit large. Ah, uh, yeah, that's fair. Um... The only reason I don't like using green stuff is I don't like having to start it up. You know what I mean? Get it get it agitated and get it ready. Because it always feels like just a, an extra step I don't need to do. But pretty clearly by looking at what we just saw, um, it wouldn't be a bad idea. Something else I printed, which is uh, over to the side right now because it was taking up too much space, is a whole bunch of uh, movement trays for my Sisters of Battle because I still have plans of creating and expanding my Sisters of Battle army. And uh, since it is going to be a little bit bigger, movement trays seem like a good idea. So again, as always, Windsor and Newton, Series 7. You, uh, you grew up needing clay, so you don't mind. Yeah, I didn't get to mess with that stuff much as a kid. Uh, I just kind of got stuck in my way of doing this. And uh, now I get really stubborn whenever someone's like, Hey, you should do this other thing that's really smart and would save you a lot of time and effort. But I'll get there. In this case, because of how important this model is, I think I'm going to do the green stuff thing solely because I don't want to break it, you know? Okay, something else actually. This is more zoomed out than I expected it to be. So I'm going to see if I can see about zooming in a little bit. I think I had it at 150%. I'm using um, uh, Camo Studio, if anyone is interested. And uh, Camo Studio does a really good job of turning your web camera, or in this case, my phone camera, into a fairly competent uh, camera for this job. 
And actually, that, that positions it a whole lot better for me. I don't know if that's too blurry or not. But yeah, so what's going to happen here is I'm going to put it on way too wet and create blobs on his head. Bad. But what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to work my way back with the, um, with the pale flesh tone that I've got. And that will hopefully kind of override this mess that I'm making. That's one of the biggest issues that I still have with uh, painting minis is moisture control on these dinky little brushes. <laughs> now he looks like he's that's really funny he looks like he's wearing way too much makeup but that's okay okay we're gonna mix back in some of that flesh tone and we're gonna reduce it back down to the actual flesh tone so what i used for the flesh tone was uh rakarth flesh which is supposed to be more of like a pale gaunt uh dark eldar style flesh tone but um in this case i felt like given that horus was supposed to be corrupted by chaos and you know, he'd already died once, came back, that kind of thing. That Rakarth flesh would be the right color to show him as alive, but not quite living. Just going to do some gentle transitions from the one color to the next. And in this case, it started off with that kind of reddish violet, and it's going to eventually work its way up to the front as more of this pale flesh tone. And if I do this right, which to me is one of the hardest parts of this mini painting stuff, uh, most of these layers and clear delineations will disappear. Also, I completely forgot, uh, Dark Bolt, that you got yourself a Brutalis Dreadnought. Really neat model. And uh, one I kind of want to get one of each. Uh, moisture control is still a problem for you too. Yeah, it's... It's weird because you think you've got the perfect amount on your brush and then uh, a big blob of water will come out of the bezel and now it's in your paint and now you've just made a horrible mess. I do not like it and it makes me say it. So something I've learned to do is uh, after I think I've gotten the brush dry enough is give it a hearty whack against uh, my paint cup and that usually gets the last of the moisture out. But yeah, I um. Actually, can, you, can I get a better angle on that? I'm going to contort myself so you guys can still kind of see what I'm doing. This is a lot of subtle work right here. But if I do it right, it'll look really good. But yeah, as much as I prefer the old style box dreads, um, I honestly still kind of want to get myself a Brutalis Dreadnought. Just because I want one of each. Now the last big thing I need to do here that actually ended up working out really nicely is give all of the parts that are kind of plugged in and all those little flesh wrinkles that are kind of puckering around the the, uh, the open plugs is give those a bit of a highlight with the base color and that's going to make them really stand out against all this other mixed flesh tone and make it look really painful which is kind of the idea that we want to have with Horus right? Beat the devil out of it Bob Ross style uh, not quite. Especially since these brushes are like $20 a bit. But yeah, I, um... Actually, you can't see my paint cup. Normally what I do with it is I'll give it like a big... A tap, like I'm, I'm a conductor trying to get the attention of the orchestra type stuff. If I were Bob Ross... If I were Bob Rossing it, I'd really be wasting this $20 brush. Which is what I did with the first couple that I got. Those ones... Too much moisture. Those ones ended up taking a hearty beating, and now they look horrifying. That one had way too much moisture on it, despite my healthy whack. Pull some of the moisture back out of that hole. You still need to get me the one of the Primaris is piloting the frame, but I currently want to get me a new box of the Venerable Dread and the Furioso, because I want to convert me a, tra a Chaplain Dread. Yeah. <laughs> um, the new models look really cool. And uh, the, Invictor, the Invictor Tactical War Suit is the other one you're thinking of. And that's not a Dreadnought. That, that, that's a walker. And it does look super neat, but at the same time, I think it looks super silly. I really kind of wish that um, that huge bolt pistol thing that it's got on its hip was, uh, was more powerful. Because then you'd have a reason to make him a cowboy, and that's funny to me. Okay, and honestly, 
That's not a whole lot cleaner, but it does look better. And I've just got to give his evil cleft chin more of a cleft. There we go. It's the same body, just the pilot isn't in a coffin. Yeah, and I think that's what kind of ruins it for me. And of course, this is, this is you know, personal opinion. Um, I really like the fact that Dreadnoughts are kind of dying slash dead and concealed in, in those coffins. Because the, it, it's like they even lose their identity. They become this new horrifying thing. And I think that's neat. The Invictor Tactical Warsuit having, like, Scout, and I don't know if it has stealth, but it's supposed to be, like, the stealthy recon thing, is really funny, don't get me wrong. But it just, it's a weird-looking, it's a weird-looking baby carrier. But I don't know. It's, it's, we're in the same world as the, uh, the Dread Knight from the Grey Knight, so I can't really complain. Um, one of my friends actually has the Invictor Tactical Warsuit. And it's one of the only models in 40k where I've looked at it in person and still thought that thing looks stupid. But that's okay. Honestly, if um, if something in 40k doesn't look stupid, then I think they done, they've done it wrong, you know? I mean, like, look at this guy. With his shoulder pads on, he looks like he's in a permanent shrug. I do love this model, though. I'm really scared of dropping this thing, by the way. Biggest machine open hatch with the lightest armor for the pilot. The Dread Knight makes more sense with the Terminator pilot. That is true too. Yeah, because they put the uh, the Phobos Marines in there, right? So they're the um, they're the stealthy ones. Okay, so for non-metallic metal, the way I do non-metallic metal, which I think you've seen quite a bit, but um, again, this is for for anyone potentially who wants to learn and hasn't seen it. I use a brown. Typically like a flat brown or a darker brown, depending on what you're interested in, how, how deep you want it to go. And then I add some kind of gold yellow, in this case Averland Sunset, because it's what I've got and it's the one I like. And then I go up to an ice yellow, which in this case I'm using Dorn Yellow as my sub-in, because I couldn't find a good ice yellow uh, when I was looking for it at the time. But, um, yep, so again, mix it up with the Vortex Mixer for a minute. Now, in this case, I'm actually trying to use up this brown. Uh, it's not normally my first choice. I usually mix it in with some black. But um, I'm trying to get rid of it because I'm trying to transition over to uh, Pro Acryl because I like their consistently, it's consistency a whole lot better. So, in this case, I'm going to do this a little bit sloppy. Especially since it's going to be the underside of his cape and uh, it's not going to be super important. Same thing. I've got an agitator marble in here. I don't know if... It I don't know if you can hear that at all, but uh, that's the agitator marble. Uh, that really helps with making sure the paint gets kind of a smoother, creamier consistency instead of, you know, the pigment settling at the bottom. You could hear it, you do the same. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's good practice because acrylic paint is just, you know, plastic pigment powder that has uh, been suspended in the medium. And if you let it settle, then it just kind of clumps at the bottom, which is no good. So I'm going to take these three colors and I'm going to slowly transition my way up. Now, the biggest thing uh, that's always kind of a problem with um, with doing non-metallic metal is light placement. And light placement is something that I'm still, still learning, still practicing. And the other problem is going to be making this look clean because I'm going to use, this is a, a Citadel base brush small that I have beat the crap out of so it's not super good for anything anymore especially not detail work but it's got a slightly wider tip than um than the uh, Vallejo brush so I think this one will serve me okay for what I'm about to do now in this case he's got two stripes going down the inside of his cloak so I'm just gonna kind of gently try and hit each of these stripes without getting it anywhere else and unfortunately because of a combination of uh, being on camera not having my glasses on and being a little bit tired seeing this is difficult for me See if I can angle the light a little better and I guess in this case this is going to be a high visibility spot 
for Horus's cape, so I've got to make sure that the metallic highlight on here looks pretty good. Okay. Now, originally, when I first put this model together, I actually put magnets in his feet and uh, tried to magnetize the base that he's standing on so I could remove Horus and place him on, like, a diorama-style uh, plinth. And then if I wanted to use him in a game or whatever, I would just take him off the diorama-style plinth and put him back on his base. And, you know, just have a whole lot of fun with how much utility I could get out of this display model uh, that I was painting. And, uh, unfortunately, the magnets I put on his feet were very weak, and so he fell off his base a lot. So I just said, screw it, and I glued him on. Uh, which, honestly, once I started painting the base, I, I regret it deeply. Because... He gets in the way of everything, but with his cloak and his legs and whatnot. But it all worked out, so I'm not going to shake him or anything, but he is pretty solidly on there. Okay. And again, just going to paint every last bit of these with the brown. Hopefully get good coverage on my first or second coat, because visually it is kind of blending in a bit to the uh, dark red that I used. Let me see if I can hit that other spot. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know if anyone here follows Magic the Gathering, but... Um... The Commander... Format of the game just got a seismic change. And, um, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Uh, if you play Magic the Gathering at all, um, and you're also a Warhammer fan, I'm sorry for your wallet because you probably don't have any money to call your own, or you're filthy stinking rich. But either way, um, Commander, for those who don't know, is a supposed to be a more casual format of magic uh normally it's played with 60 cards and you're allowed to have four copies of any one card for consistency and uh you play against one person and that that's a standard game of magic and commander was meant to be a more casual game that was originally invented uh as a way to like kill time between matches at tournaments and instead of uh, four copies of a card, you could only have one copy of any card that wasn't a land, a basic land, and which is how you get resources to cast spells. And um, you had what was called a commander, which was a legendary creature that kind of led your army. I don't know if you guys can still see that. No magic here, but money, what is that exactly, right? Uh, being very low-level IT and playing Magic and Warhammer was not a good decision on my part. But with Commander, you choose a legendary creature, and that legendary creature is like your leader. He's your commander. He or she or they. And, um, the only cards you're allowed to have in the deck have to match that commander's color identity. So if your commander is, uh, red and blue mana, that's what they have to spend to, uh, to, to cast them, you're only allowed to have other spells that are red or blue mana or generic colorless mana. And uh, instead of being a 60 card format, it's 100 cards. So there's a lot more variance and generally uh, you're able to play cards that you otherwise can't really play in more competitive formats. And for the longest time, Commander's been kind of like the casual game of Magic, where you, you spend not too much money to buy one deck that's customized to your personality, and um, you can play against friends that way. And back in like 2019, they created a, uh, a rules committee, whose job it was was to try and make sure that cards that were kind of not good for the health of the game were... Uh, talked about and considered impossibly banned or restricted. Well, in this case, banned. And um, last week they banned four cards that were all relatively important or expensive or powerful. And uh, that created a huge backlash with uh, a part of the community who became very angry that either 
their cards in their deck were no longer usable, or um, cards that they had invested a lot of money in were now worth uh, potentially going to be worth less, or some combination of the two. And um, honestly, I wasn't one of them. I frankly couldn't care less because I don't play Commander uh, competitively, which because that just seems like why would you play a game that was meant to be a casual game competitively? But that's just me. Other people do it and they get great enjoyment out of it, so bully for them. But anyway, um, some some groups of people got really mad. And uh, they started sending uh, a lot of hateful language and rhetoric, and including apparently death threats, to uh, the Rules Committee, who were an independent volunteer group. And uh, the rules committee basically decided we can't operate like this. This isn't safe for us. This isn't good for us. This isn't good for the game. So they have decided to partner with uh, Wizards of the Coast, the creators of Magic, and just give them control over the rules committee. So um, the company that is printing cards to make money is now going to be the one deciding which cards are legal in the most popular format of Magic. And uh, that seems to be a huge conflict of interest, but it seems like the people who are kind of spearheading it within Wizards are also, you know, passionate fans and, and et cetera, et cetera. But that's been, yeah, death threats, uh, a, a totally rational response on the internet. I know, right? Especially over a card game. And I say this as someone who did at one point collect magic very seriously and did spend a lot of money on cards. But it's like, come on, guys. This isn't something you should make your main source of wealth or money or income or whatever you want to call it. It is a card game that was developed for, for young adults and kids. So, um, yeah, the perspective wasn't there. And now they've basically kind of forced the rules committee to, to abdicate. Gotta love a fraction of the player base causing a massive shift in EDH. I know, right? That's the worst part. Also, hi Stroop, good to see you. I'm Ben Repaints. I'm trying to paint a non-metallic metal trim on the inside of Horus's cloak. And to be honest, I'm struggling a little bit because this is a strange angle to try and hit all this from. But it's also one of those things where you kind of have to trust the process and trust the ugly phase. Because eventually, once you start layering on the lighting and the uh, lighter colors, it is going to look really good. Oh, thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. Being upset is fine, but threatening people is never okay, no matter the severity or reason. Uh-oh, what happened to the camera? And yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It was a fun game when I played and I got out of the cardboard for plastic. Yeah, I'm kind of there with you. I started playing uh, Magic the Gathering right around... Uh, Hour of Devastation slash Ixalan. Uh, gosh, about eight years ago now? I don't know. But, um... I kind of got out of it around the pandemic because I realized that Magic the Gathering was starting to put a huge dent in my finances and I needed to find a hobby that wasn't quite so expensive. And around that same time, one of my best friends was starting to get into Warhammer and I kind of followed him into that hobby, which, in retrospect, was very silly. Uh, don't don't try and get into Warhammer to save money because magic is too expensive. Because now I play both. That's not good. But anyway, so I've kind of layered over a brown to a brown yellow up to the Averlin Sunset, which is kind of a, a golden yellow. And next what I'm going to do is take a little bit of this ice yellow, this Dorn yellow, and mix it in with the Averlin Sunset to... Um, make it a smidge brighter. I'm not trying to go too much brighter, just a smidge. And I'm also going to knock some of the moisture out of the brush, and now I'm going to highlight an even smaller section. You moved to another state and basically sold your magic for 40k. Uh, that's fair entirely. Uh, I know some people who did that, they were like, yeah, I I'm done with magic. I'm going to sell out of it, and I'm going to get into another hobby. And uh, I don't know, they seem to be happy with it, so I'm glad it worked out for them. I sold a lot of my collector chase cards, and that helped fund my mag or my uh, Warhammer habit. And it also allowed me to uh, help my fiance now wife uh, get a commander deck. 
So now she can play Magic whenever she wants to. And we can both play in what's supposed to be the casual format. This is going to need a decent amount of cleanup, unfortunately, for me. Because my brush discipline isn't there, isn't here for it tonight. Which is fine. I mean, I kind of started off by going in the deep end with some non-metallic metals to immediately start uh, the stream. So there is going to be some difficulty here. Enabling your spouses. I know, right? Uh, I have a really cute picture of her from... Um, we went to Hatsukan, which is a big convention up in Oxon Hill, Maryland. Uh, as like one of our first big cons together. And um, she brought her, her dinosaur deck. And one evening when we were just kind of walking around and chilling, we found the magic room. So we went down to play. And um, she ended up popping off and her deck ended up dumping a whole bunch of dinosaurs onto the battlefield all at once. And so I have this picture of just like a full board state on her side of every dinosaur that's ever been printed, it felt like. And uh, her just kind of looking at me like, what now? And then she swung in for lethal. So it was all good fun. Hey, Lotus K. Uh, good to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for hopping by. Uh, my name is Ben Repaints. I am a miniature painter who uh, likes to stream on Tuesdays, and I'm kind of here for everything. I'll, I'll do some commissions. I'll paint some of my own stuff. I'll give advice to anyone who might need it, because even though I'm, I'm not like a competitive painter by any means, I feel like I have a strong enough grasp of most of the techniques that if anyone's new and wants to learn, I can kind of help them get there. Or at least let them know how it's done and they can see someone doing it real time. Because as much as I love the YouTube videos and I am eternally grateful to them for their instruction, um, the fact that they're kind of able to cut it out and uh, edit it so that you're like, brush stroke, brush stroke, brush stroke, then suddenly it cuts to them being almost done and it's beautiful, uh, it doesn't always help me the most. And I really don't have the patience to watch an entire four-hour video of someone practicing the technique. So being able to respond to people live is kind of the way I like to do things. Yeah, now draw the rest of the aisle. I uh, love the piece I'm working on now. Thank you. This is um, Horus Ascended. He's the, the big bad from the Horus Heresy from Warhammer 30k, in case you didn't know. Uh, my wife and I paint together when we can. You're a filthy Nurgle follower. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. I paint Death Guard. I have a Mortarian that I am exceptionally proud of. But, uh, let's see what I'm doing here. But yeah, to, to zoom him out a bit, this is, I'm, I'm almost done with the guy. Uh, the biggest thing I really need to work on, I worked on his face a little bit to start off the stream, and, um, I need to finish up his base because I'm not really happy with what the base looks like right now. It's kind of underwhelming compared to the rest of the model. And he's got a bigger scenic base that goes with it, so I kind of want to make sure it all looks good. Okay. Oh, thank you for the follow! Uh, but yeah, this is... That little bit right there is kind of a quick and dirty example of non-metallic metal. And this one was a bit more challenging because it was um, on a flatter surface. Normally, non-metallic metal works really well on raised surfaces because they kind of tell you where the highlights are. But um, learning how to properly reflect the light is one of the big challenges. And it's the thing that I'm still kind of learning. Um, something that I read, and I've seen a lot, which makes a lot of sense, is, you know, study references. Look at other pictures of metal trying to do the same thing you're doing. So if you're doing armor... Find pictures of metallic armor and, and study that. Look at how the light is reflecting off of said metallic armor. And while obviously, you know, uh, reenactment armor or historical armor is not going to have the same reflections as cataphracty Terminator armor from 40k or 30k, uh, it will give you some similar ideas, right? Because there's only so many ways you can shape metal around a person's body. And, um... That has helped me quite a bit. But it's something that I'm still practicing, still getting better at. My goal one of these days is to be able to enter a Golden Demon competition and place, which is an incredibly lofty goal.
but as long as I have something to chase, I found that I tend to stick better to hobbies. And so, as long as I keep thinking about getting that golden demon, or at least being able to say that I competed for a golden demon, and it wasn't just a joke entry, is a big deal for me. And for those who don't know that are watching, the Golden Demon is kind of like uh, the World Series or the Super Bowl or whatever for painters uh, who, who paint miniatures and Warhammer in particular. Uh, it's pretty well recognized as the place where the best painters go to uh, show off their skill and be recognized for their technical abilities. Now, one of the things about that, to be completely honest, is that Golden Demon judges are definitely looking for a specific style of painting, right? Um, they're not necessarily looking for heavy metal, which is the style used in, in Warhammer uh, advertising art, but th they, they have a specific style they're looking for. And uh, I don't know if I'm painting to that style or not. I don't really care. But I still want to enter and have people not look at my entry and go, well, this person clearly doesn't belong here. I want people to look at my entry and and see it as an also ran or you know this one looks like it could win so hopefully i'll get there someday and in the meantime i'm just going to enjoy the journey have you tried other uh competitions like capital palette i honestly didn't know what that was and uh, now that you've mentioned it i'm going to be compelled to look that up uh, I actually recently entered a competition locally. Um, there was a convention at the end of August, and uh, it was it was uh, a mini gaming slash tabletop gaming uh, convention. And one thing they did was they had a miniature painting competition that was hosted by the local game club, and uh, they had a uh, it was it was miniature painting, and I entered one of my guys. And, uh, sad to say I didn't win, but I did come in third, and that was very impressive for me. And, uh, it also kind of showed how far I'd come as a painter. Not Nova Open. Good lord, not Nova Open. It was nowhere near that big. Um, yeah, no, I'm... I wanted to go to Nova Open, but a combination of money and starting a new job meant I couldn't. Um, but yeah, someday I'm going to enter a competition at Nova Open. I'd like to go there. I'd like to enter a painting competition, do all that fun stuff. Uh, I want to go there. I want to go to Adepticon. There's a lot that I want to do. I feel as long as your work is interesting, you'll catch eyes. Yeah, that's something to look at is, does it cause people to stop and stare, right? Even if it's not technically perfect, will it, does it cause people to, to look at it? Uh, this was a much, much smaller one uh, that was far more local. And it was like the first ever time they had done a, uh, a painting competition attached to this convention. But anyway, um, yeah, I placed third, and I was really proud of that, but was was kind of a tell for me on how much I, how far I've come. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the good, or for the well wishes, Dark Bolt. Is that I saw the other two entries, and my biggest thought was, I could have beat them. Like, they were both really good entries, but... In a combination of, of me being competitive in a way I'm normally not, and uh, a little bit of sour grapes, um, I looked at the other two entries and thought to myself that mine's better. And that's not something I typically do. Uh, I'm usually pretty low-key when it comes to competitions because, uh, you know, humility and confidence and that kind of thing. But I looked at those two, and I went, come on now, mine's better than that. Now, clearly, the judges didn't think so, and I'm pretty sure the judges know more about this than I do, but it was just kind of reassuring to know that I had enough pride and confidence in my work to, to immediately jump to that, instead of, you know, why did I even enter, or any of those other feelings. Okay, I think I want to go up just a little brighter on the color palette there, and then that'll be good. Kind of the same thing. And then just go straight to the ice yellow, thorn yellow, whatever you want to call it, for the very smallest of highlights. Now, one of the things that I'm really learning when it comes to doing non-metallic metals and highlights in general is that you've really got to trust putting smaller and smaller amounts with 
each progressively brighter layer. Like you've got to give you've got to give it enough time to like let your eyes do the work for you. You know what I mean? Um, if I were to continue making everything bright, it would just be really bright. But because I'm giving the eyes kind of room to breathe and take in the light versus the dark, uh, it really sells the idea that part of it is brighter than other parts of it. Okay, same thing here, just a little bit. Nothing too much. Look right there. And there we go. Now most of the cape, when he's upright, is going to be facing down. So you're not going to see too much of it. But it's just enough that when you look at it, you can see that there's more gold inlay uh, underneath the cape, right? Now it's time for me to do this other part. Oof. But yeah, um, I've always enjoyed kind of doing these uh, things that require a lot of skill and focus and just getting better as you continue to do it. Mindless repetition, that kind of thing. So miniature painting ended up just being like the perfect hobby for me. So I saw mention that one of you is a Nurgle follower. So you play either Chaos, you play either Chaos Demons or potentially Death Guard. I guess my next question is, which system do you play? Because I know that um, the Chaos Demons are part of both 40k and Fantasy slash Age of Sigmar. So I'm curious, do you play Sigmar? Do you play Warhammer Fantasy? Do you play 40k? Death Guard and 40k, fantastic. A fellow Death Guard player, very cool. So what was your favorite unit to paint of the Death Guard that you have so far? Because I think, honestly, I feel like um, the Death Guard have one of the strongest model line lineups of any of the 40k armies. Uh, their reintroduction and re-release in 8th edition was just so strong. So powerful. Such an aura. Such a stinky aura. Hey Phantom, how's it going? Welcome to chat. You're gonna open a big can of worms for me asking him that? Oh no, I'm sorry. Okay, then, uh, I will not ask that question. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really like the Death Guard. I think they're super neato. I know that, uh, you're the wife. Oh, well, um, I'm sorry for the, the Death, I'm sorry for the stinky boys. What do you play? Actually, I'm curious. What, um... What armies do you collect? Because you mentioned, I believe you mentioned earlier that both of you paint together. Uh, do you collect any armies? Do you play Age of Sigmar? Do you play 40k? Do you play Fantasy? Either of you play Necromunda. Your favorite to paint was either your Rodigus or your Lord Felthius. Your best model is your Tallyman. Very neat. I ended up um, 3D printing a Rodigus because I can't afford uh, that model since he is kind of pricey. That and my wife hates rot, I guess. She does not want there to be a great unclean one in the house, so uh, she's she hasn't stopped me from buying it, but she's definitely tried to show me other things and convince me to get those every time we're at a game store. You paint, you don't play? Yes, Rodimus Prime, oh dear. Uh, yeah, I, I don't play the game very much either. Uh, the actual rules of 40k are fine for what they are, I guess, but that's not where I get most of my enjoyment. Um, I enjoy the painting, I enjoy the fiction. Uh, I'm trying to play a little more because it feels like I'm in this weird place where I want to get better at it, but I'm just, I need to get more mental reps in, you know what I mean? So yeah, um, Herodicus and most of your army was bought via MTG cards. That's absolutely fair. Uh, I actually, I was going to buy a great unclean one when um, I won a local painting competition at a local game store, uh, I entered two. I had two entries. One was a set of Blight Lord Terminators from the Death Guard, and the other was uh, a Rabute Gilliman that I painted entirely in non-metallic metal, which was really stupid because he was my first major attempt at non-metallic metal. You're working on some sisters. Those are also an awesome army. I have a small army of sisters of battle. 
And actually, my goal, I was going to try and do a Golden Demon entry this year at, uh, for, for Nova Open. I was actually planning on going to Nova Open. And um, when I got the job, I, I, I was in between jobs for a little while. And um, when I got a transition job that I was very excited to have because it was kind of a nice bridge job into the uh, career that I wanted to get into, I bought the Triumph of St. Catherine. And I was going to really work on uh, making sure that it was a beautiful model. And I was going to spend like a month on each part of it until I eventually had it all done just in time for Nova Open. And then I hyper fixated on it and, fi and uh, finished it in like two months. So it's not Golden Demon quality, but I did a good job. And I actually ended up placing third with that model, too, in the same uh, painting competition as... Oh, I didn't say the other entry that I did. Um, I entered two models in August, and they both won third place, which felt pretty good. Uh, the other model that I did was Abaddon the, Des the Despoiler, which is a big reason why I'm actually painting Horus the way I am now, because I know canonically he wears black armor, and, like, the shoulder pad is still Sons of Horus colored, but... Uh, I got Abaddon the Despoiler just kind of as a fun project. And I started painting him. And I realized they didn't want to just do black, because I feel like black is... kind of a flat color unless you're really good at it. And I'm not super good at making black not flat. So I decided to paint him the Sons of Horus colors. Which are that really cool, like, ocean spray green. And uh, I really liked how the model turned out. Uh, so I decided I want to do that again. And I was originally going to do like a Chaos Space Marine army in that color. But um, then a, a friend and a local client who, who asked me for commissions is like, Man, I really want to get you that Horus Ascended model now if you're going to make him look this good. And at the time I was helping him with a commission. I told him, hey, since it's about the same price anyway... How about instead of paying me for the commission, you get me Horus Ascended? And he said, bet. And that's why I have a Horus Ascended. But yeah, um... It, the, my little... My little guy over in the corner, my, my, my PNG tuber, um, Darkvolt actually uh, created that while he was watching me talk about how much I loved my, my Abaddon model. Um... And if I recall right... That's kind of where it came from. And actually, you can see he's holding the Abaddon model in, in, his little, in his little grubby hands. So yeah. it's. I think I did a pretty darn good job painting him. Okay, so that's looking pretty okay. Yeah, you, Dark Vault, did an awesome job. Before then, I was using a fairly hastily crafted uh, 3D model I had made of the character in Blender, and uh, Darkfold definitely helped make it look a whole lot more cute, which is kind of what I was trying to go for, just not very well. Um, okay, sorry, I gotta focus on this. Just doing little bitty highlights. Up and down. Okay. There we go. And yeah, like I said previously, a lot of this now is just about light placement and making sure to ma uh, make your highlights kind of concentrate themselves in spots on the mini where highlights would occur. And so I think it was already pretty cute. Thank you. I appreciate it. I love my progress that I've made. Mark working my way to be better at your Death Guard paint scheme. That's got to feel good too. Um, Death Guard are really cool because you can either be really fast and loose with the paint job. Oh, thank you, Patty Bates. I appreciate it. Uh, Death Guard can either be really fast and loose with the paint job and they look good because they're supposed to be sloppy, or you can be ultra precise with your sloppy and actually make them look beautiful in an odd kind of way. And so, I'm not sure what your paint job looks like, but I'm pretty sure it looks really cool. Um, we I do have a Discord that I don't really post to a we don't really post to a whole lot. It was originally recommended when I first started streaming uh, as a way to just kind of let users show off their minis. 
And um, I'm pretty okay with it just being for that. I do announce when I'm going to stream, chat every now and then with the other users on there. But that's kind of all it's there for. Uh, I believe the Discord link should be on my Twitch homepage. I'm going to have to go back through this with some paint, uh, red paint for the cloak. Because I have accidentally splattered a whole lot. Just like orcs, fun to paint at any level. Big agree. Orcs are super fun. I, I, I got kind of obsessed and I tried to make an orc army uh, for a little while. But that fell to the wayside because I have the attention span of a goldfish. I did get a really cool Gazkol Thraka out of the deal, though. Which was going to be my entry into the painting competition until I finished Abaddon in like three days of obsessive painting. Okay, kind of the same thing here. Again, placing highlights where I think they would go, where the light would reflect most off of... off this part of the cloak and leaving darker shadows to create that nice light dark contrast. Kind of want more tabletop weight already with my painting. I've been more focused on some of the knights and demons. Oh goodness, chaos knights. Chaos knights are awesome. I um I briefly had two war dogs and an abominant because I um I bought the chaos knight box just cuz I thought it was so cool. And I ended up selling them cuz I realized I was never going to play chaos knights and they were just kind of sitting in my basement. Oh, thank you, Phantom. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. Um, I was never going to play with them, so I ended up selling them. And honestly, I kind of regret it a little bit, but I'm pretty sure I used that money to buy myself some more stuff for an army I cared about more. Um, I actually play Imperial Fists as my main army, and I think that's actually the only army I really have played on the tabletop in 10th edition. I don't think I've played Death Guard at all, I know for a fact I haven't played Sisters at all. I'm more collecting those just because I like the armies. Okay. I think that's about as far as I want to push the cloak. You wanted to go kind of 30k with the knights and vehicles, wanted to make it seem like the Death Guard raised them instead of brand new, which is a really cool idea. Like, they're literally zombies rising from the dead, which is awesome. But yeah, I think that's as far as I want to go with Horus, at least with the main part, because... I got the cloak looking okay. I might clean it up a little bit off off of, off stream. Um, I know for a fact I'm gonna have to do a little bit more with some of these raised ripples in the cloak to really bring it out because I kind of neglected the underside. But the upper side, actually, I don't know how well it shows off. There's a whole lot of variance going on there, and it really does a good job of bringing it out. Um, but yeah, I think by and large he's done. Very cool model. I really like this model. This is a cool model. Thank you guys for watching me paint this model. Um, I might clean them up a little bit more. I know, okay, no. I know for a fact this right here. This poor Imperial Fist is going to need a lot more TLC because he just kind of got a really quick paint job and it doesn't look that great. So I'm going to want to clean that up a bit. And what I think I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go back over him with brown. That's what I'm going to do. He's going to be brown. And then I'm going to work my way up to probably the yellow that I use, Averlin Sunset. So let's go ahead and drop this guy back down to a brown. Because this was the weakest part of the base for me. I think the rest of it turned out pretty okay. But the Imperial Fist corpses that I have on here... Uh, they were just kind of making me mad because I didn't like how they looked. And so today is going to be the day that I rectify that. Um, yeah, I like the Imperial Fists. I like the fact that they're kind of the perennial losers of the Space Marines in the Imperium. Uh, they don't tend to win a whole lot, and that's okay. I do not mind that they are the ones who get beat to death to show how dangerous or scary this new foe is. Um, it creates that against the odds situation that I think is really neat. And it also doesn't hurt that they're really on theme on the tabletop and they're legitimately one of the worst factions in the game pretty consistently. Um, I find that to be very, very funny. Okay, let's get some of that in there. 
That Horus looks amazing. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, it took me quite a while to get here. I think I, I've probably pushed a good uh, 15 to 20 hours into the model itself, which honestly makes the base even funnier because I'm pretty sure I just frantically slapped paint on the base for about two hours and then was like, okay, I'm done. And that's honestly why I'm going back over it right now because I'm not happy with it. I feel like it's not doing Horus a service. Uh... Marco Mach Kutchen, thank you. Just checking to tell you how incredible this looks. Thank you. Much appreciated. Sometimes a story needs a good wharf. Yeah, tell that to the Eldar. Poor Eldar. Their avatar of Cain. I really appreciate the compliments, guys. Um, I'm glad to know that I'm impressing someone out there. And the good news is, is that if you ever aspire to paint like this, I know you can do it. Because for quite a while, I was pretty dog water at this. But I just kept working. So just keep working on whatever style you want to get to. I think one of the coolest things for me, honestly, was learning how to do table ready armies quickly. Because there was a point where that was my forte. I got really good at painting up a ton of uh, tabletop ready armies really quickly. Okay, so now he brown. Basing is my Achilles heel. It is difficult, man. Uh, it's something you've really got to practice, because you got to visualize the setting they're going to be in. You put a lot of work into them, it's turning out nicely. Thank you! But yeah, uh, something that kind of helped me was um, Midwinter Minis a long time ago. He, he spent like 24 hours painting uh, a single Eldar Farseer, and then he had Trevarian miniatures uh, give him a critique on it. And even though he was friends with Trevarian, uh, Trevarian didn't really pull punches. He was very good about being honest without being mean. And I really appreciated that. But one of the things he said is that a huge part of at least competitive painting is that you're trying to make the miniature be exactly that, right? I'm pretty sure that was his video. Where he, he was trying to say that, you know, you're not trying to paint a miniature. You're trying to represent a miniature depiction of life. And um, a big part of that is trying to represent the model as though it is actually in an environment and you're actually telling a story with it, right? And so um, doing the base, you kind of want to tell the narrative you want to tell with it. And so while I'm still learning how to do it, it did kind of give me a perspective whenever I make a base for a miniature. It's like, what story am I trying to tell with the terrain I'm putting around him? And a lot of the times, I'll be honest, the story I'm trying to tell is, he's on a field. He's shooting at something. And for a lot of models, that's enough, right? For some, though, you might want to have a little bit more. And that's where the real fun of basing comes in, is, is getting to create those dioramas. Um, one of the things that I'm actually eventually going to start bonding really hard with my wife with is that she loves dioramas, just like the making of them. She's enamored with them in the same way that I've always been, but I've always been too much of a coward to actually try and make them. But I'm getting to a point where I'm running out of excuses to not do it. So at some point, I've asked her multiple times, hey, if I were to make a diorama, would you help me? And she's always like, yeah, of course, I'd love to. Which is a big reason why I love my wife. Uh, but that's something I'm eventually going to have to broach with her. It's like, hey, I finally have an idea. Here's what I want to do. Can you help me? Storytelling is pulling interest, and it's because we humans love stories. That is very true. I mean, this is going to probably... I don't know if this is going to come across a little weird, but I'm a big pro wrestling fan. And um, I've always been a big pro wrestling fan. And when I was a kid, it was because, you know, you're a kid. You're enamored with the stories they're telling. But as an adult, I became enamored with their ability to tell stories to an audience that knows what they're doing is fake. You know what I mean? Get people that kind of emotionally invested. And so, um, I just think that that's a neat skill to do. And, uh, it's something I'd like to be able to do with these minis at some point, is tell a story and get people emotionally invested in what's happening with the minis. Like, I don't know if you saw it, uh, a couple years ago, I think, uh, one of the Golden Demon entries for 30k Age of Darkness was uh, Karn and Erebus' duel from Betrayer. And if you've never read Betrayer, 
and you don't know about Karn and Erebus's duel, um, it's a fairly famous scene because it's one that watches Erebus get his teeth kicked in, and everyone hates Erebus, but also you get to see Karn just be incredibly cool. Um, he, he's good friends with another word bearer named Argel Tall, who spends a majority of the book trying to protect Karn, because Karn is starting to really feel the Butcher's Nails, and it's causing him to become increasingly erratic and violent, and lose his sense of preservation. And, um, near the end of the book, Argel Tall is, is, uh, betrayed by Erebus and killed. And Karn doesn't know this. And at the very end, Karn is told by Lorgar who killed Argel Tall. And the word, wor world eaters have, uh, I don't know if they're necessarily the dueling cages, but they basically have parts of the ship that are specifically designed for them to be allowed to beat the crap out of each other. And Erebus has been joining in in these duels. And generally when two combatants enter the ring, they, they kind of state and agree what severity they're going to, right? Uh, first blood, for example, or second blood, or in very extreme and rare cases, sanguis extremis, which means to the death. And so Erebus is in there, and he's beating people up, and uh, he's about ready to fight another guy, and then Karn comes in. And Karn interrupts and says, I'm fighting him. And then when asked about, you know, how far are they going, he just says Sanguis Extremis and pulls out Gore Child, which is one of um, Angron's chain axes. And then he proceeds to beat the ever-loving piss out of Erebus really badly. Erebus has no chance. And as he's doing so, and as Erebus keeps falling over and over again, Karn just keeps telling him, get up. And eventually, as he's about to kill Erebus, Erebus finally has enough and teleports away, but you get this great moment of Karn enacting some incredibly righteous vengeance on a character who very clearly deserves it. And at a Golden Demon a couple years ago, someone entered that moment as a diorama. And the way they did it was really cool. They had... Uh, world Eater, Horus Heresy Karn in his white armor, you know, his white blood-stained armor, standing over a very stricken Erebus, and he's casting a Long Shadow, and the Long Shadow silhouette is of Karn the Betrayer, the, the 40k Karn. And I'm still really sad that one didn't win first, because I felt like it deserved it. But that was because I resonated so strongly with the story it was telling. I don't know if that was interesting to y'all. I hope so, because 40k lore is awesome. You love the description. It is a good one. Let me see if I can find it, actually. I gotta find this now. Um, I really got into the Horus Heresy lore. Uh, Golden Demon 2023. I'm pretty sure it was 2023. I can find it. Uh, uh, okay, here it is. Images. Oh, this is terrible. You guys did a bad job. They have all the pictures, but they're just like they took photos of them in in the shelves. That doesn't. This helps no one. Okay. Do 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 do. I'm pretty sure this is where I found them. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Sorry, guys, just give me a minute. I'm, I am I got so into that description, I gotta find it now, you know? Oh. Of course, Darren Latham. Maybe this was... Was it not that last year? Hmm. Okay, well... Maybe it's on the Golden Demon Code. Nope, it's not there either. Okay, whatever. I'll find it eventually. It's not right now, because I'm supposed to be streaming. But yeah, I thought that was an incredibly cool moment. And also, I'm already liking the color on the Imperial Fist a whole lot better than I did a minute ago. That looks better. Poor Imperial Fist, you guys can't win anything. But yeah, um, if any of you are interested in reading any fiction from the Horus Heresy... Um, I really strongly recommend 
the word bearers. The yellow looks way cleaner. Thank you. The story of Mortarian is another good one. Mortarian's story is really good. And I really appreciate how the Buried Dagger kind of presented it. I, I very much enjoyed listening to the Buried Dagger. I thought that was a great one. I don't like what they did with him for um, the Dark Imperium trilogy. But I feel like people who think he he was completely neutered and defanged were also wrong. But I don't know. I just, I, I like Mortarian a lot. I like what he represents. I like his character arc. I like the fact that he is, in some ways, a fallen angel and, and hubris and all that fun stuff. But, um... But, yeah. And, yeah, in terms of the yellow being cleaner, it definitely still has some grime to it, which is what I want, since, you know, he's dead and in parts. But I was trying to be lazy with it the first time I did it, and I just kind of slapped on some contrast paint over black, and I dry-brushed it real sloppily, and it just didn't look good. So I'm glad that this is turning out a whole lot better. But yeah, um, Mortarian is easily one of my favorite Primarchs just because of the duality of that character and how he has had to kind of become everything he hates and how awful and miserable that is for him. Okay, I think... I'm going to blend this together a little bit, but I think that actually looks a whole lot better than it did a minute ago. So I don't really want to touch this too much more for now. But yeah, I was actually trying to follow Vince Vincerella's video and how he did it, but he also left Horus off the, the base so he could attach it or address everything a lot more cleanly. And obviously Horus being on the base ruins that. Uh, I just like how in 30k everything is so much more pristine than 40k, yet way less ornate. That is true. Um, that is a neat function of 30k, is that everything in a lot of ways was better, but in a lot of ways was also not as good. And so you can kind of see here um, how yucky all of this looks. So all those guys are going to get kind of a do-over. Back to brown for all of y'all. What I think is kind of neat is I I both appreciate and am a little disappointed in how awful the Imperium still was in that era. But I also kind of appreciate that from a storytelling perspective, it's to show that there was never any renaissance for the Imperium. They've always been awful. And um, people who hearken back to, to the Imperium's early days and the Great Crusade is this great Halcyon moment, uh, are again, wrong. Because nothing about this time period is good. And I think that that's the right kind of grim dark. But it is neat seeing uh, them do throwbacks to like Rogue Trader stuff with uh, some of the, some of the, uh, the 30k units, you know? But yeah, I'm also having a blast seeing the returned Primarchs and what they're doing with them. Like, uh, I really, really like the new Lionel Johnson model. Uh, I liked it so much that I, I volunteered to paint it uh, for someone because it's just such a cool model. And uh, they wanted me to go as close to uh, the heavy metal box art as I could. And I think that I by and large succeeded. I even got to put them on a neat display base. Uh, I kind of wanted him to look more like he was emerging out of the forest, but uh, was unable to get that. But it still looks pretty good. I even made a little toolbox for his extra heads because I magnetized him so that he had, like, you still need to paint yours. Oh yeah, I keep forgetting. You're I don't know why I keep forgetting, but you're a Dark Angels fan, and you're very clearly collect them. I will let you know right now that Lionel Johnson is an absolute blast to paint. Uh, I had... I don't think there was a moment where I didn't enjoy painting that model. So I can't wait for you to get started because you're going to have a blast painting Lionel Johnson. Okay, and um, what I'm kind of doing in terms of technique with this guy is um, very much a very standard way of doing painting. Uh, the the heavy metal style, well not the heavy metal style, the style that uh, Games Workshop kind of espouses 
uh, is not this. What they kind of tell you to do is find a mid-tone. Find the color that you want the mini to be and, and paint on that layer. And then hit them with a wash so that all of the darker parts of the mini... <clears throat> excuse me. All the darker parts of the mini get their nice little shadowy bits and then go back over with a highlight. And that's perfectly valid. And if you're painting your, your 40k army that way, then congrats, you found the best way to make an army look good quickly. <laughs> uh, you need to finish your two predators. Yeah, I wish I had predator tanks. I'm, I am I got into 40k right after the Primaris line kind of emerged. So most of my dudes are Primaris, and I wish they would have just made true scale firstborn, but that's me. Um... One of the ways that I've kind of been trained to paint and kind of train myself is I start with the darkest color that I'm that I'm going to go with, and then I slowly work my way up to the highlight colors. And I'll be honest, I blame Philon Miniatures for a lot of that. If you don't know who Philon Miniatures is, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice. He is a tremendously talented painter who's apparently only been doing this about as long as I have. Your Death Guard list needs uh, long-range options. Uh, yeah, that's the one thing Death Guard is not particularly good at, is anti-tank and uh, long-range shooting. Uh, predators are still available. We got the Horus Heresy Predators now. Yes, that is true. Um, that's a huge reason, actually, why I want to get into Horus Heresy, is I really want to start uh, going back to some of the Firstborn models. I want to have a reason to own those other than collecting them. I was actually going to try and buy a box of war dogs and add those to my um, my Death Guard army. Death Guard want to hug people too? Yeah, they got two options. They want to throw kisses from afar and they want to give you big old hugs when they get in close. That That's how the Death Guard operate. That's why they're smiling all the time. They know that they're going to shower you with love one way or another. Okay, but yeah, um, that was something I almost did myself. I almost bought a set of war dogs so that I had some more dedicated anti-tank for my Death Guard. Because the only vehicle I have right now is a, um, a single Mephitic Blight Hauler. Everyone will join the Endless Cycle one way or another. Yes, they will. Like, eventually, you're going to be one of us. Like, um... I used to work at a hardware store uh, in America. We have one called Lowe's. I'm not sure how far out into Europe that goes, if at all. But uh, when I started working at Lowe's, um, it was around the time that companies were starting to downsize their staff and really start stretching their resources. But one thing I learned very quickly is that people would get very mad at the service that they would get at Lowe's because we were so understaffed. And they would, you know, we're never coming back here again. And then they'd inevitably show up a few weeks later once they realized no one else had the same stock options we had. Lowe's is not a thing here, but I've seen it on YouTube videos. Yeah, they're just a big box store that sells hardware stuff. Uh, they used to pride themselves in having, like, experts in all of their uh, departments. And then they realized that was costing them too much money, so now they just hire anyone who is competent and wants a paycheck. But, um... When I got there, the, the slogan for Lowe's was, Lowe's, let's build something together. But as I worked there and saw how employees were treated, or how customers were treated, and how they kind of had to come back anyway, uh, my slogan for Lowe's became, Lowe's, you'll be back. Because it's not really like they had a choice. Home Depot wasn't much better. Okay, we're going into kind of this gross mustard brown now, uh, mustard yellow, because that's going to kind of be start of a highlight color for every part on this. Something else that allegedly helps with figuring out highlighting is reducing everything down to their basic shapes. So like this kneecap that I'm working on is for all intents and purposes a sphere. So, yeah, Warhammer is... Yeah, Warhammer. You'll be back. We'll have your money one way or another. And so when I do this, I want to kind of imagine, okay, this, this right here is a cylinder, so where would the light hit the cylinder the most? 
And where would the light fail to hit the cylinder? And that will hopefully help guide my highlights at least a little bit, right? And so it's all about that sphere, cylinder, box kind of uh, visualization you can get when it comes to doing light like this. So, as best you can, and of course it never has to be perfect on your first try, that's how you learn to get better is by not being perfect, right? Go ahead and just start trying to fill in where you think the light would hit on these specific parts of the model. And then you can go back later and fill it in and correct it as you go. And so, already, even without meaning to, I guess kind of meaning to, um, the representation of, like, grimy, dirty, dilapidated armor is already better than it was when I was just kind of slopping paint on and hitting it with a wash. So I can't say that repainting this was a bad idea. And what'll help, what'll eventually help a little bit more is that when I start doing the highlights, the highlights will start drawing the eye towards, you know, the brightest spot on there, and everything else will kind of fade away as just a detail. And that's exactly what you want. And hopefully, That'll come to pass when I'm done with this. Now what's also helping me is I'm using a very badly beaten up brush where the tip is kind of toast. It's it's curled and it doesn't go very sharp, which is pretty good for my purposes because I, I, I want to be able to do multiple quick, almost stippling like strokes on this. And if I do that with a good tip, it'll ruin the good tip really quickly. By doing it with this um, beaten up brush, I don't have to worry about it as much. So that's also something that I suggest if you're interested at all in, in kind of tips, is get a cheap brush, let it get beat to shit, have that be your beater brush, and have a really good precision brush for when you actually want to do the details. Now I'm assuming that a good number of you already know that, but you know, this is just for anyone who might be interested. Okay. I will also say, as best you can, don't buy Games Workshop's brushes. They're fine, but they're overpriced. And unfortunately, that's a pretty common thing with Games Workshop, so that they can make their profits. Because as much crap as we want to give them for being overpriced, they are kind of running really close, as I understand it. Okay, now these gouges in his pauldron are going to be interesting because unfortunately I filled them pretty deep by just putting a whole bunch of crap and paint inside them. So what I'm going to do here is kind of sideways hit them so I'm almost hedge high edge highlighting them. And that will hopefully keep them there for later because I am going to go a little bit brighter with those and highlight them so that the light is going to bounce off of the edge of, of those scratches. And hopefully that'll all look okay. Okay, a little bit more Averland Sunset mixed into the brown. And let's get that gnarly chest piece of his. Now, honestly, I always thought that my first Horus Heresy army was going to be the Imperial Fists. I love Rogel Dorn. I think he's a cool Primarch. I wanted to make an Imperial Fist Horus Heresy army. But apparently that's not the case. The second army I thought it was going to be was Death Guard. Uh, you usually go for a hobby shop for my brushes. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the smart thing to do. That's where you're going to find like the ones that are, are are quality enough for what you're doing, but cheap enough that you don't break the bank. Now, the one that kind of disappointed me a lot, but I hear a lot of good for, is, is the Army Painter. Um, I've used their brushes. I wasn't very impressed. Admittedly, I was also not that good, so I probably beat them up far more than they needed to be beaten up. But uh, one thing that I did was, uh, when I was first trying to decide whether I wanted to get Kalinsky Sable brushes, is I bought a set of uh, Da Vinci brushes, I believe, and a single uh, uh, Army Painter Kalinsky Sable brush. And I just remember the tip on it being so awful out of the box. And even though I would do everything in my power to try and get the tip to sharpen again, as soon as 
I put it to a model, it would immediately split. And given that they were all bought off of Amazon, there's a really good chance that I just got a dud and their brushes are actually good. But that was kind of um, my last experience with them. Army Painter detail brushes are awesome. I actually bet they are. I wouldn't be surprised if their detail brushes slap really hard. And I'm glad that you're here to say that because I would hate for people to think that um, I'm just here to dump uh, to dump on Army Painter. Um, I've heard that their Fanatic paints are really good too. Have you tried out Army Painter's Fanatic paints? If I were to make a second Space Marine army, I would do World Eaters. You like the white and blue? And for the 40k, you could use the Blood Angel rules. That is very true, and that would be really cool. Yeah, the white and blue look on the World Eaters is so freaking good. Um, one of my buddies is, um, he was more into the hobby before finances started hitting him really hard. And one of the last major purchases he made was Angron, the Demon Primark version of him. And uh, him and I started painting Angron, Angron and uh, we got him up decently painted, but he's nowhere near done. And I've honestly just been kind of waiting for a moment where he has both the financial security and the free time to come back and we can finish Angron. You use Citadel for most of your paints. You do have some Army Painter paints as well. Very cool. Yeah, Citadel are good paints. I like Citadel. Um, I moved away from them initially because I kind of listened to the internet too much when they were like, yeah, Citadel's okay, but you're paying too much for them. And yeah, I get it, but they're fine for what they are. Um, I've used them again since moving away from them, and I'm never disappointed. So, you know, take that for what it is. But, uh, yeah, I've heard that um, uh, Army Painter's Fanatic line, their new line, is really good, and it, it blows the pants off of their old line, which makes me happy because uh, I really didn't like their original line of war paints very much. The best way I could describe them, especially as I started getting better and understanding the different paints, was that the Army Painter war paint line felt like I was painting with melted butter that someone had stored near... Uh, food coloring because I never felt like I could get any kind of consistent color off of those paints so I'm glad that they've kind of went yeah no we understand that our paints had some criticisms and that uh, the community as a whole had issues with them so we completely revamped them and we've made them really good I think that's cool and I have I want I actually uh, for the August competition. Their new line of paints are miles ahead. You prefer the Cro Pro Acryl line? That's actually the line that I'm trying to move to. I love the Pro Acryl line, and I've only used a couple of their paints. And uh, I'm glad to hear some confirmation that Army Painter's Fanatic line is so much better than the War Paint line. Um, I have Pro Acryl red, black, brown, I guess dark umber, and uh, I think bright ivory and white, titanium white. And I've been impressed with all of them. Uh, yeah, I have Dark Umber. This one is just plain ivory. Uh, the only thing that I have some umbrage with with Pro Acryl is I think that their dropper bottles are kind of funky. And I really don't like how it leaves a ridiculous mess on the top. But honestly, for how, how beautifully consistent their paints are, uh, I'll definitely go with it. And uh, that August competition I keep referring back to, uh, first place for the single model was supposed to be like the full Pro Acryl set. Uh, I use my old Army Painter as the majority of my painting. I really want something reliable. I use my Citadel paints. I still need to get some more Fanatics, but I'll get them when I run out of colors. That's, actually, that's, that's probably the most responsible way to look at it. And I, I applaud your, your sense of self-control, because that is not something I have when it comes to this stuff. I've been fighting for the past... Since I got paid, basically, uh, I've been fighting the urge to go down to the local game store and buy, like, 20 Pro Acryl paints and just mass uh, replace uh, my, my Vallejo line that I've got in my makeup bag right now. Um, you can buy the flip tops for the Pro Acryls. That is true. That is true. Uh, it's something I always forget about. 
but uh, to be completely honest, it's it's not something I want to do because I'm I'm already spending decent money on Pro Crows. I really don't want to have to spend more, and the caps don't bother me that much. I just kind of question their judgment because they advertise the caps as a uh, a benefit when very clearly they seem to be the least popular part of the line. If I find paints I really like, you buy the same one uh, more than a few times just in case. Yeah, that was me with Pale Sand. Uh, Dana Howell uh, hopefully got some kind of commission from our, from uh, Vallejo for it, but she definitely sold me on Pale Sand. And uh, it's one that I use, I used to use a lot more, but I ended up buying like three bottles of it at once when I saw it at a local game store down in... Uh, North Carolina. While I was visiting my uh, my fiance now wife, and uh, it's been really good for me ever since. Hey, shiny uh, mu paints, how's it going? I use pale sand all the time for mixing instead of white. Yeah, it's a really good warm white. So, shiny mu paints, how are you doing? How's your day been going? I am kind of touching up these Imperial Fist corpses that I have on my base, because when I first did them over the weekend, I kind of went into a trance and tried to get it done as quickly as possible because I realized I was getting close to finish with this model, and it looked terrible. Well, it didn't look great, I'll put it that way. And so now, I'm going back over it to try and make it look better. And so far, it has been a success. Uh, I've done the same with Citadel Death Guard Green, Lead Belcher, Wraithbone, and Screaming Skull. All good colors. Vallejo apparently re revamped their model color line. Yeah, that's my understanding. They have, like, vibrant new bottles, and the colors are a lot more vibrant. But, um, I've already kind of committed to Pro Acryl, and I'm just going to keep on riding that train. Feeling good? Finish the model yourself. Cheap viewers on? No, thank you. I don't want cheap viewers. I want people that actually want to... Or how do I get there? Well, you know, the cat. Very cool. Yeah, this thing can screw off. Uh, I just got an ad that I don't want. Technical question. Uh, since it looks like you're painting wet on wet, do you have to account for colors blending in the model, or does it dry quickly enough uh, because of the scale that it's not a concern? That's where I, I mentioned earlier, hot and cold AF, that like moisture control is a big deal, and I'm really bad at it. Uh, like you can see right now, probably, I don't know if you can, the, the brush is really wet here. And when I put it across my hand, you can see it kind of puddling. That's too wet. So what I do is I have a, um, a little piece of crappy sponge, or I uh, use a paper towel and I kind of dry it off. And then I kind of mix the paints together. And if I need to, I, I wipe it off a little more. So I actually have a habit of painting a little too dry on dry. Uh, but it does lead to the model kind of not having the issue of wet on wet. You know what I mean? And I also, uh, if I see too much moisture, uh, kind of pr uh, push it against my thumb to give it a test. And if, if it puddles, then it's too wet. And if it doesn't, uh, then I'm probably good to go. And that was just a lot of trial and error as I kind of learned. But yeah, I'm putting it on, I don't know if you can tell by scale, but these are very, very tiny bits. So I'm putting it on a very small model in a very thin layer, and on top of the talking I'm doing, that usually gives it enough time to uh, to dry before I hit the next one. Okay, I got something to show. What do I have to show? Oh, oh, look at that. Okay, so let me see. I need to go back a little bit because I missed what uh, what was shown me. Oh, you finished the mini. Okay, so this is the mini you showed. Let's go check this mini out. Uh, da 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 da. -da. It is a cool little goblin model, and my goodness, one of my friends got Space Marine 2. Holy crap, one of my friends got Space Marine 2. I'm so excited. I gotta play Space Marine 2 with him tomorrow. Um, uh, it's a friend that I've been trying to get to play Space Marine 2 for a while, so I'm really excited they finally got it. And also, a follow for you. Uh, let's see. Oh, there it is. There's the goblin that Shiny Mew Paints was doing. Uh, that looks awesome. That is a neat little model, and I want to get into doing more than just Warhammer, not just, more than Warhammer models, and it's been kind of a struggle, because I can I can never really find, like, a model that makes me go, I want to paint that, and then I get anxious when I do find one that I'm not going to do a good job on it. So, I think 
once I finish Horus, I'm gonna try and find something that isn't Games Workshop, so I can take a crack at doing just a completely non-Games Workshop related model. You tend to brush your wet brush over your dry palette to get more, a bit of moisture off. Um, yeah, that sounds like that. That sounds like a good idea as well. Can you post a link to where you buy? Please do. Um, it's a really uh, this. So you made this model because if you did, it looks fan freaking tastic, and I'm probably gonna end up buying it, painting it, or another one, especially since I've got a real nice three D printer. But yeah, that looks fantastic. Please advertise for yourself. While you have my full authority and blessing. Look at that model. Let's see. On this one done sculpt by Twin Goddess Miniatures, printed by Build Plate Minis, Goblin Citadel Color Miniature Figures, Mini Painting. This is a really good one, and you did an awesome job with it. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. Okay, let's see what we got here. Oh, another... Oh, wait, it's... Is that the same one? Yeah, you, you posted the same link twice, I think. What's going on in here? That's, that's an attachment from another friend. Okay, I, I've confused myself. That's okay, though. Uh, we're going to go ahead and... Oh, it's in the Discord. You follow Twin Goddess because of the goblins? Yes. Yeah, uh, Shiny Mew Paints, it looks like you posted the same thing twice, uh, which is just an, uh, another... The same link to the uh, the picture that you... The, yep. That's okay. As soon as you post it, I'm probably going to throw it in the uh, in the Twitch chat as well, to be completely honest. Um, But yeah, that is a cool mini, and you did an awesome job painting it. I think I follow Twin Goddess Miniatures on uh, on my mini factory, so that might be, especially after seeing the paint job you did, that might be someone that I look at and um, and print out so that I can have something fun and a little bit different to paint for the next time. Might even ask me. There you go. Four years of practice. Very cool. Let's see. Okay. That's just way too thin and way too wet. Wet a layer. Let's see what you got here. eBay or Etsy. Ooh, it's an Etsy shop. Build plate minis. Oh, <laughs> that is a Nurgle rubber ducky. And that is adorable. It's going here. Bam. For anyone who's interested in buying one of these minis, they have rubber duckies of different chaos gods and different, um, different things. A so duck displacer. They've got the rubric duck. They've got a berserker duck. Oh, that's a really... Yeah, and then they've got a whole bunch of other 3D printed minis from other systems. Including some of the really good Baldur's Gate proxies that, to be completely honest, look better than the official ones that were just released. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Hopefully you guys can see the link in the chat, and you guys can take a look in there and see if you find anything you like. Okay. A little more in there. Oh yeah, I was working on this helmet, so let's go ahead and... Now, a skill that I'm trying to get better at is knowing when to stop. You know what I mean? Because, um, I mentioned it earlier, but especially when you're working on building up volume, you kind of want to highlight smaller and smaller areas of the model, or of the surface, so that you're not getting you know, just too much saturation of a bright color. Because that just ends up being very flat. And so, um, trying to learn to let the colors blend together and let your eyes trick yourself into thinking you're seeing an actual physical highlight is both difficult, but also really rewarding once you get it right. And so that's kind of what I'm... Jiggly Sticks is also a good mini sculptor, but they're a bit more spicy. Once again, I think I know who you're talking about just from kind of browsing around. And um, that's something else I kind of want to do. I've been squeamish about it because it would probably make me a little uncomfortable to do it on stream. But um, I'm not even uh, doing what I, what I guess are called pinup models, you know? I think they're a great study in how to do skin well. Because many models are very covered up. And so you don't really get to see a whole lot of skin on the model. And so you don't get a lot of practice, but having one of those pinup models definitely means that you're going to get your practice with the skin. And honestly, painting uh, realistic skin is like a marvel to me. So it's something I need to start learning, and the only way I'm going to start learning is if I either focus on a bunch of minis 
that have more skin or explicitly start printing like pinup models that show off a lot of skin so I can get better at painting it myself. Um, a couple years ago, back when I was first trying to improve with this stuff, uh, one of my friends, uh, they knew someone who really liked Ada Wong. Uh, as a digital painter, skin is fucking complicated. You are not wrong there. Uh, put more minis in the Discord? Very cool. I'll check them out in a second, okay? Uh, actually, Hot and Cold AF, if you want to see something amazing, uh, I'll pull it up in a second. There's a, a miniature painter named Darren Latham. And I want to say they worked with Games Workshop? I don't quite remember. But uh, they just recently did some character studies on a Space Marine bust that uh, had different heads on it. And so they did different skin tones, they did different looks on it, and I am amazed at how good they turned out because I think the actual head on the mini is like the size of a pinky. Okay, let's see what else we got. Ooh, very cool. Uh, I'm gonna open these in a browser so that I can kind of bounce back and forth between them. Oh, the info. I like your use of a water bottle as a uh, painting handle because that was considerably cheaper than the stupid painting handle that I bought myself. Okay, so let's see. Window slide should start. There's another neat little gobbo. I'm going to zoom in. Thankfully, is that supposed to, That's Oh, that's Bowsette. That's Bowsette, but as a goblin. Very nice. I'm going to go ahead and close some of this stuff out. And then we got a Skeletor. That's a really cool looking Skeletor. I might have to print and paint that for a friend because he loves He-Man. And that's a cool model. Let's see, we got... This is what's called an Infernus Marine, for those who don't know. Uh, they are the, the Space Marine Intercessor, which is kind of like the baseline Space Marine. But they're carrying a huge heavy flamer called a Pyre Blaster instead of a rifle. There's another shot from the side. He's all he's all gunged up because he's obviously seen some combat. And there's the toilet bowl, <laughs> uh, the ultramarine symbol uh, to show that he is of the ultramarines chapter. Last but not least, another gabo, another picture of the gabo. Very nice, very good job, very cool. Let's see if I can get back to. Uh, would it be on the Instagram? Is that where I found the Darren Latham? Yeah, let me find that real quick, because I think, especially because, uh, from what it seems like, the world of mini painting is still relatively new to you, so... Oh, okay, they pinned it, so that'll make it nice and easy. Bam! So, Hot and Cold AF, there, each of these are about the size of my pinky, if not a little smaller. They're not quite as small as the guy that I'm working on, uh, but they are definitely not, like... You know, Barbie doll size. You need to get back into 3D sculpting. You want to do gabos? I completely understand. I, I want to get back into learning Blender, but it's just I don't have the time for it right now. But yeah, the level of detail that this person was able to get is just, it just blows my mind. I know, don't they? Those faces look absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've become increasingly impressed with mini painters because of it. Uh, yes, yeah, so here are more shots. I don't know if you can... Oh, oops, 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 there they are. Here are more shots of more of his stuff. Darren Latham is like my hero. Really, really good paint jobs. And I think somewhere he's got a picture of the size. Maybe not, yeah, so you can see how big his finger is compared to um, the size of the, of, of the head there. These are not very big. And it really is all just a bunch of extreme brush control, and, uh... Oh no, one of my friends is... one of my friends' friends doesn't feel too great. Uh, the extreme brush control and just precision that they have, and their, their amazing adherence to color theory. Um, my wife was an art major, and graduated with a, a degree in graphic design, so... And she herself is an independent artist, and, uh... I used to talk about how I'm, you know, I used to say, you know, I'm not an artist, and she would kind of give me a look, and I would say, well, not like you, and she would have to be, she would have to say, Benry, look at what you're doing. You're an artist. And so I just kind of, kind of got to remind myself of that, that this is an art form. 
you are expressing yourself on a medium. And so to shortchange yourself and, and short sell yourself is not cool. Acknowledge the cool things you're doing. Okay. Yes, I love my wife. She's super cool. She also likes the mini painting, but not quite as obsessively as I do. And again, all I'm doing, I'm kind of using, I, I flattened out the tip of this brush just a smidge. And what that's kind of letting me do is use it as a, a, um, a dry brush. And with a dry brush, I'm not really trying to get a super clean, super specific spot painted. I'm just trying to kind of gently fill in in spots that I think would be like high points. And that will hopefully give it a little bit more clear definition. There we go. Yeah, no, she's definitely helped with like making sure that I don't get too down on myself and I recognize how good I am at things and my achievements and the like. So I hope every one of you have someone out there who supports you like that. Okay. Okay, something else that I've got to learn and I've got to get better at is even like stroke direction matters when you're moving your brush. So because the light and the focus of color is going to be near the top of this pauldron, I want to drag my paint up towards it. And that'll leave better transitions near the bottom. Which is kind of what I want. Because paint will not be puddling down near the bottom because the brush stroke will not end down there. Uh, the low self-esteem is part of being an artist. <laughs> Fair enough. I always enjoy seeing your stuff on Deutsch's Community Days. Dark Fault is unfortunate. Thank you, I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm at a point right now where I kind of recognize I've gotten good at this. Um, it's getting more difficult for me to pretend, or for me to be self-deprecating about my own work, because um, a little while ago, I reached a point where uh, I saw a photo of something I had painted, and my immediate thought was, you know, a year ago, I would have looked at this on, like, social media and thought, damn, I can't wait until I can paint that well. Or I wish I could paint that well. But I just painted it. So I can't really act like I'm not good at this. And I was going to do uh, a community day entry this month, but I had a whole lot less time to paint as I've gotten kind of into my new job. And so the only thing I've really painted this month has been Horus, and he's not done yet. So, uh, unfortunately, I was not able to enter this month. So next month, I'm going to have a fun entry, hopefully. Because this lad is a big un, and he's very impressive. Okay. Just trying to get these... Again, I'm, I'm doing a lot of the same thing at this point. I'm going relatively deep into the shadows and pulling out towards the light. So that way, the brightest spot of the paint is going to end up at the, uh, at the highest point of the model. And hopefully, all of that will kind of work together. Something else that I don't have on here that I typically use is Airbrush Flow Improver. Um, it was a trick that I picked up from watching... Vince Vincerella video and it was something he did to kind of show off how to do a good dark dark leather on a cloak and I realized that it was pretty widely applicable anywhere you're trying to do a blend but if you get airbrush flow improver uh, on your on your paint what it kind of does is it makes it, it slows down the drying time on the paint itself and that gives you more time to kind of water it down real thin and also blend it into a previous layer. So Airbrush Flow Improver is a really cool tool to use to thin down your paints without having it puddle and get watery. You've gotten to the point where I thought back to my recent work and how my inner child would have been so excited to see the work I do, remembering what I aspired to be like. And yeah, that's, that's, that's something I really appreciate about miniature painting, is that you get tangible results, right? You may not realize you're getting better, but then you kind of look back at some of the stuff you've done, or you look back at some of the stuff you're doing, and you go, wow, I've gotten good at this. You know, I've improved. And I don't know, I just think that's a super cool feeling. 
because there's so many times in, in so many hobbies or so many other things where you look at where you are in life or you look at what you're doing and you just ask yourself, am I actually doing this right? Am I actually getting better? And a lot of the times you don't know the answer because you don't have much to measure it with. Hey Grimlehe, how's it going? Good to see you. Uh, thank you for hopping into the stream. I'm Benry Paints. I'm just kind of a small time miniature painter. And right now I am trying to pretty up Horus Ascendant's base because I did a, a slapdash job on it and I wasn't very happy with it. But yeah, as I was saying, you know, you don't really know if you are getting better. And so having something as tangible as a product in front of you to show you how much you've improved, it becomes kind of undeniable at that point, right? You can't say, oh, well, I, I'm where I was. I haven't changed at all. I haven't gotten any better. When you've got a thing in front of you that clearly shows that you've improved. And that's just got to be inspiring. At least I think so. I feel like um, we all need victories. And even if it's something small like getting better at a hobby that you enjoy, it's something, right? Okay. With that being said, I think I've made the stuff as good as I can. Now... No, I'm going to do the Aquila on this guy's chest, but I'm going to need something a little more sharp. So now I'm moving back into the precision tool, and you can definitely see um, how much pointier it is. You feel like you needed to hear this. It's hard sometimes to remember the progress takes time. I know, right? It's it's difficult, and it's it's hard to keep that perspective that you are getting better and you are improving. And hopefully... Once you get a chance to step back and really look at what you've done, you can see how much you've improved. Um, like I said, when I first started this hobby, I, I actually, when I was much younger, I tried to do miniature painting. I bought a, a Robotech model. And this was back when it was like impossible to find modeling kits for anime and that kind of stuff. So I was beside myself with joy. I was finally going to be able to paint a, a Veritech fighter and um in like its mech form and it was going to be the coolest thing ever and i was going to paint it red and white and i was going to make it look so good but i didn't know how to paint and i wasn't very good at it and when i painted it it looked like dog sh i'm not going to say that it looked real bad it was not a good paint job it was very chunky uh, it was a typical first paint job and i remember looking at it and thinking wow i'm not good at this and i don't think i'm ever going to be good at this so I, I put it away, and I kind of didn't look at it again, and I kind of figured that mini painting was not going to be in my wheelhouse. And when I was working as a school teacher about five, six years ago, I had a friend who was really into Dungeons and Dragons, and I was really into Dungeons and Dragons, and they suggested, hey, Benry, have you ever painted miniatures? And I told them, not really, it's not something I'm into, and they were like, I think you'd really enjoy it. So they invited me over one day and, and kind of introduced me to the world of mini painting. And I was very anxious because I would, had been so bad at it that first try, but they were very patient and they were very friendly and gave a lot of good advice. And they just kept kind of encouraging that. And uh, as I continued to get better at it, I just started realizing, oh, maybe this is something I like doing. Maybe this is something I can do. And here I am. And yes, Robotech is very nostalgic. Yeah, keep your old work, even if it's cringy, that just shows how much you've improved. Uh, I was, I'm was i bad about that. I don't keep my old work. But to be honest, I take photos of it. So I still have it. I've mentioned before in a previous stream that uh, I don't have my first ever Space Marine Intercessor that I painted like six years ago. Uh, I've painted him over since. But I do have photos of him. And, it'll, and I have them on my timeline on Facebook uh, because I, I posted a picture because I was real proud of it at the time. And uh, so every year I get a reminder of, of what it looked like and just how much I've improved since then. And yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, in my, I'm almost in my late 30s for anyone who is interested in my age since I mentioned 
an anime like Robotech. And so I grew up on, on Robotech. I, I used to think that show was the coolest shit in the world because they had jets that could transform into friggin' robots. And I thought that was the coolest thing. Uh, and so that's actually something I've been meaning to try and find is a really good Veritech model so I can kind of redeem myself for how badly I painted it the first time around. And I'm probably not, it's probably not that hard to find nowadays because Matt Cross and Robotech is kind of recognized as one of those legacy anime. But it's just not something I've really thought too much about since getting into the 40k. And also, that's a slight lie. Um, my first army was the Tau. And um, I distinctly remember when I bought Commander Shadow Sun, I decided that I was going to paint Shadow Sun to look like Miria and her uh, Veritech fighter from Robotech. And so she ended up being red armored. And it was one of the first, like, half decent paint jobs I did. And so when I bought a Tau Combat Patrol, what well, was a start collecting at the time, and it came with the three uh, crisis suits. I painted them to look like, um, gosh, what was it? Max. Uh, oh my goodness, why am I forgetting the name of of the big guy? Uh, the 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 two disciples that worked with with Rick Hunter, and just a third generic one. And uh, I refused to get rid of those. I'm probably one day going to get like really decent professional looking photos of them and then strip them and repaint them in the exact same scheme because uh i really like those models okay uh right now all i'm doing if you're interested is uh trying to create greater contrast in some parts of these minis because uh, if you notice the yellow kind of does blob together so if i give them little edge highlights to kind of give the eye a clean border to look at it separates up some of the lines on the model and gives the eye line something clear to distinguish it. So like that little dent in the, in the helmet, you probably didn't notice that too much until I just gave it this slight little border. And that's kind of all I'm doing. Just trying to create more separation so it's not one big blob of yellow and uh, bone color. And I'm doing so by mixing ice yellow with this golden yellow that I'm using, which is uh, Averland Sunset. Because I don't want it to be too stark. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I see a lot of painters make is that they'll go way too bright with their highlights, and then it just ends up being really big and blocky, and uh, kind of detracts from the paint job that they've just done. Okay, last little thing I need to do, and this is, the, this is gonna be the sucky part, is I've gotta go ahead and, actually do I? I was going to say that I should probably paint the trim on all of these armor bits black. But to be completely honest, I think with how dirty and grimy they look, they contrast enough with the yellow armor that they are going to be okay. Okay. So, oh wait, I can't put them all together because I forgot his uh, metal plate fell off. I'm going to be lazy again. <laughs> I'm not going to use the, uh, the green stuff today. I'm just going to go ahead and super glue the, the disc back on and then I'm going to put it on the magnet and then I'm going to leave it there and hope it doesn't fully attach every part of him together. I'm just going to put a bigger blob of glue on it this time. So if you give me a moment, I can get this back on here and then we can look at the whole thing. Okay, good. And then, at some point, I can actually get a full picture of the model with, like, good professional lighting. Because uh, I, I'm not, like, a professional photographer by any means, but I did work as a yearbook coordinator for a couple of years. And what that did was it taught me to appreciate photography. And so I have a decent enough technical understanding of photography. You know what? His lens is going to get painted. One moment, please. And mix some of that together. Purple, purple, red. Oh, all of it's dried because my wet palette slop. So there's the lad. And yeah, that yellow looks so much better right now. But I'm going to take this helmet lens. And I don't know how good this looks on camera, but I'm kind of focused in right now. 
when I painted the yellow lens with like a purple red to give me a shadow color to work off of. And then I'm gonna go ahead and take some more of the red by itself, really reduce the amount of moisture in this brush because my goodness, it is swimming in it. I'm just gonna add a little bit of There we go. So yes, this is Horus Ascended. Wow, that gold ended up looking a lot better in the undercloak than I thought it would. I love this model. Holy crap, I love this model. I didn't know if I was going to be able to outdo Abaddon, but he's pretty darn close. I'm probably going to end up cleaning up some of the uh, the shadow on the, on the, the dead... Uh, the dead Imperial Fists, but I'm pretty darn happy with how he turned out. That's a good looking model. Okay, I'm gonna put him somewhere safe for right now. Honestly, that somewhere safe can be back in his box. Thank you very much, Darkfold. I appreciate it. Uh, I can't wait to show him off at Community Day of uh, the end of October. Now, honestly, what I was going to do... I'm going to work on this. But, um... I don't think I'm gonna, because that would require me to, to put up the airbrush. And honestly, I'm not feeling the airbrush tonight. Uh, that would be too much of a hassle. So, wow. There's some really cool details on this. So this is going to have to stay home another day, because my plan is to take this to work and turn it into a pencil case. Actually, hmm. Hmm. Do I want to turn this to a pencil? Or do I want to color this? Yeah, I think I am going to color this up. It's going to look so cool once I finish that. But in the meantime, what do I want to do? I have some Skaven. I think I'm going to work on some... Wait, it's 910. Mm. Okay, so here's the problem. My wife finished early. I usually come down here and work on minis while uh, she plays D&D &D with her friends. But um, she finished early because one of her friends was feeling ill. So... I kind of don't want to stay down here if my wife is ready to hang. I can show off some stuff, I guess, and then I can go. Um, I'm looking for a name. I don't know if Stroop is still here, but if you want to see some... I, I, I'm going to show off some Death Guard, because I'm really proud of my Death Guard, and I think they turned out really cool. Uh, bu -bu 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 And actually, I can also show Celestine off, too. Uh, I have these Death Shroud bodyguards that I'm really proud of doing. Um, I found a high contrast... Uh, I found a high contrast paint scheme from uh, Philon Miniatures. And I really like what he did with it. So I went ahead and followed it and did these Death Shroud Terminators. And I think they turned out pretty okay. Uh, I showed them off on a community day... Uh, many moons ago, many months ago, but I just think they look really good. So that is what my guys look like right now, and that can lead me into the Mortarian. Um, I don't remember if when I did Mortarian and showed it off on Community Day for Doig Swift, if I had redone the uh, the wings yet, but uh, since then, actually, you know what, I can check. I have my Community Day stuff up here. And, oh no, ho ho ho. So when I showed off Mortarian for Community Day, um, I had done the armor, but I hadn't finished with Mortaria. I, th I thought I was done, but then I realized I didn't like the rest of it. So I went ahead and touched up Mortaria in a lot, so that um, a lot of different parts of him definitely popped a whole lot more. So, group is an ad break. Oh no, why is there an ad break happening? I thought I had it so it was only at the beginning. Whatever. But anyway, yes, that is... Those are my Death Shroud bodyguards. And I went with a really high contrast style. But, uh, let's see. Let me let me go to Mortarian. There's my Mortarian. That's the Mortarian. I actually followed a couple of different guys for that. I continued using, uh, Philon Miniatures High Contrast for the armor. And, uh, I follow... There's a guy named El Miniaturista who does amazing, amazing work. And I really liked what he did with the wings. So I tried to mimic that to the best of my ability, and I think it turned out pretty okay.
So yeah, that's my Mortarian. Um, I can't wait to field him one day, because I have actually yet to play Mortarian in a game. I've played a couple games in ninth with the Death Guard, but I never have gotten to play Mortarian. I know in 10th he's not so great, but I still want to try. Um, one other one. So, you guys just saw my, um, my Horus Ascended. Uh, let me find it. This was the Abaddon that, uh, it, that, that placed third at, uh, at the local painting competition. That's not the Abaddon that placed third. That's a gallery of the Abaddon that placed third. There's Abaddon. And this is also the mini that's in my hands in the corner that, uh, that Darkfold painted for, or, yeah, painted for me. So yeah, like I said, disappointed I placed third, but I still love this model, and I still think it looks great, and I'm really proud of it. And, um, let's see, I've got some other stuff that I can show off too, like, um, Sisters of Battle. Uh, Lotus K, I've got Sisters of Battle to show off, because I know you like Sisters. Uh, I have a Saint Celestine. And I'm really proud of the St. Celestine because um, I originally tried to uh, copy a very difficult technique. There's a painter named Flame on Miniatures who does the most beautiful non-metallic metal I've ever seen. But they definitely are at a higher skill level than I am. Because I tried it and it looked terrible. So I said, screw it. And I just dry brushed them. So other than some touch-ups, this Celestine and the Gemini Superior are completely dry brushed. And uh, I think the non-metallic metal on them turned out pretty stinking good. So if you ever need any inspiration on how to dry brush or on how to do some non-metallic metal for your uh, Sisters of Battle, just dry brush the crap out of them. I promise it'll look good. <laughs> and then you can fill in all the other details later. And actually, just recently, I also got a uh, Exorcist tank. But no, the next thing, I'm not is happy with this one and I kind of want to go back and, and work on it again but um where'd she go lost her I lost her triumph of St. Catherine um I spent quite a while on it and I painted up the triumph of St. Catherine uh uh yeah, show and tell is fun this is my triumph I found your Instagram and was browsing the post oh thank you uh this was my triumph of St. Catherine uh, unfortunately, because of how big the model is and uh, how limited my photo booth is, the pictures are not the most dynamic for it. Uh, eventually, I'm going to actually go back and take better photos. But one of the biggest problems I had with the Triumph was just that she's really big. And trying to paint it to look good was, was very difficult. And I think based on this, this mess right here, which unfortunately you guys can't see, my palette, my wet palette, is finally biting the dust. Um, it's got a big old tear in the paper. Now, if you ever you have that model, just haven't done anything with it yet, it's very intimidating. Um, painting the Triumph was incredibly intimidating, and um, the only way I was able to do it was in sub assemblies. So, like all the bits for the Triumph, I kind of stuck to paper clips, which I then stuck to sprue bits. And that allowed me to, to really work on each bit piece by piece. And uh, that made life a little easier. Oh my god, that... <laughs> that is an expression. Um, that is a good expression. But yeah, uh, that, that definitely helped, was being able to go through each individual part of the Triumph and uh, kind of take my time with it and really work on the individual bits. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, Hot and Cold AF. Um, I don't know how much you know about the Sisters of Battle, but in general, um, they're probably the most evil faction of, of the Imperium, of the humans. Um, they, they, they definitely, uh, expect you to die for the Emperor, and they have these things called cherubs, and, uh, I think they modified it so they're vat-grown. So they're not entirely just made up of babies that were stolen from people. Uh, they're kind of like little clone babies that they use to carry holy scripture, or in some cases, ammunition. Um, but yeah, they are incredibly creepy, which is the point, right? Like, you're not supposed to look at the Imperium and go, Oh, cool, I want to be like them. You're supposed to look at these guys and go, That's horrifying. These are legitimately the villains of the setting, because 
everyone is the villains of the setting. And I didn't even notice this, but I did a, a much better job on that sword than I thought I did with the non-metallic metal. Go me. But yeah, so... <laughs> ah! All of these are, uh, like I said, all of this... Ah, and some Battle Sisters that I did. Uh, all of these are are very much like, do it in bits. Oh, thank you for the follow, SLM. I appreciate it. I'm actually kind of winding down because I reached a stop point. I finished Horus Ascended. Actually, that's what I could do for the rest of the evening before I go upstairs. I can take some quick pictures of Horus Ascended. Um, I think originally they were infants that died without having had the chance to serve the Emperor, so they turned into cherubs. I actually like that better than them being fat grown. Because that's both horrifying and... I don't know, less, less gross than them being like stolen babies. The fact that they were like repurposed is both disgusting but also fits right in line you know almost nothing about warhammer most of what i know is about the orcs because the orcs rule oh i got two orcs i can show you there um they got I, wait no i already showed you they got they got shown off at at community day uh i painted gauz cold thraka and um if you guys want to see a little evolution of that gauz cold gauz cold gauz cold so there's Gaz Cole and Makari back when I first got them. And they were first being based. And then there's Gaz Cole after I, I spray painted him and I started working on the skin. I'm actually incredibly proud of how that face turned out because uh, it looks really darn good. And there he is with his lower jaw equipment dealy from a different angle. You could probably tell I colored in the gums a little bit better so that way it wasn't just white on white. I tried to do non-metallic metal on his head. I think it turned out okay. There's Makari. Makari's back. Gazko getting some metallic dry brushing and edge highlighting. Gazko again. There's Makari looking way too happy. Gazko again. Makari. I went way too hard trying to do non-metallic metal with the highlights. And I kind of hated it. So I reduced it back down. And I really covered him up to be a lot dirtier. And I kind of like how that dullness worked off him a little better. So there's my Gosco. Gunworks 2, they're all purple. And I bet they're gorgeous. So if it's like, I guarantee you, you have the best looking orcs that have ever been painted. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to see them. But I guarantee you, they are beautiful. There's my guys. I'm really proud of Gasco. I actually, um, Station Forge is a 3D modeling company, and uh, they do their own version of the orcs called the Orcas, and uh, they're a little bit better proportioned than the 40k orcs, which is kind of like a, okay, that's fine. Um, but what they do have, do I have my, one moment, I'm, I'm looking for a lad, there he is. Um, they have a version of a character from one of the novels, and I liked him a lot, so I went ahead and love how the gas cool turned out. Me too. I, I think that's... So yeah, this is a Station Forge orc, and they've got the same kind of thing going on. Uh, I love them. I love this one. I think his squig is terrifying. It's got way too many surfaces on it, and I made the eyes just a wee bit too feral, but that's okay. Look at that thing. It's ready for some snuggles. Um... But yeah, good model. I like it a lot. Uh, I have a couple... I have, I think, a thousand points of orcs, and my idea was I was going to make them called the Fanboys, and they were all going to be movie references, but I kind of ran out of scheme, steam, and now I haven't worked on the middle. Okay. Um, that being said... I, yeah. So, I see that we've got some more viewers, and that's fine. Uh, one more time for the audience and the cameras... Horus ascended. He is practically done. And so what that means is after I go ahead and raid into someone else, I'm going to go ahead and get some really nice photos of him, the best that I can, and then I'm going to post them on the Discord. And then they're going to get posted to social media. So, hopefully that can happen. But let's see, I'm curious who we can raid into, because there's a lot of you here, and I'd like to do someone a favor, because I enjoy... Uh, Helping other people get more viewers. So let's see. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, the dungeon lounge is on. Uh, are they... What are they doing, though? Are they doing... 
Mini painting? Oh yeah, they are doing mini painting. Let's go raid the Dungeon Lounge. They're really cool. I like them. Dungeon Lounge. First Okay, here we go. Okie dokie. So thank you guys for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for such a good turnout. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Hopefully I'll have more cool stuff to show you next time. And I will see you next Tuesday. And uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye, guys.